Hello and welcome back. And that's right, it's the final part of our coverage of IFA here in Berlin. It's myself and Eddie. Say hello, Eddie, there behind the camera. Um, and this is a summary of all of the smaller things that we came across throughout the course of this event that I didn't think we should really put into their own individual videos, but this is a larger compilation. Some of these are new products. Some of these are things we've spoken about, and some of these, frankly, are stuff that isn't even here, but should be. So this is a quick supercut of all of the smaller things to do with network attached storage, to do with NAS, to do with DAS, to do with more, that we didn't fit into their own individual video. So let's crack on with this big old montage. I mean, let's be honest, that is an absolute beauty, isn't it? This is a new Ace Magic Mini PC, and they're going for what they call the 1983 reimagined design here. Now, for this compact mini PC, more so than the design, of which, you know, fingers crossed, Nintendo aren't gonna get mad. The one thing I will say that stood out immediately is the CPU. This has got that AI Ryzen 9 HX 370. There is also an option to get the 8845HS CPU. Now, why that's important is that second CPU there, unless only I would need to check off camera, but I'm pretty sure that's an ECC supporting CPU. Now, there's no mention on the card that this arrives with about that, but I will say, more so than the design is the fact that we're seeing quite aggressive CPU in such a compact container there. Now, this is just a prototype model. So for example, one of the things they were relaying to me is how you're gonna be able to access the internal components. We've got a couple of locks here on the base of the system and the top will come off. And inside there is where the intended final products will be. Now it's got two M.2 NVMe slots. Based on those CPUs, one would assume they are going to be Gen 4. Now, whether they're gonna be Gen 4 times 4 at this scale with that temperature, I think remains to be seen. In terms of network connectivity, we've got two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports and a myriad of 10 gig USB in Type A and Type C. Again, this is still a prototype we're looking at and I would really like to know how they're gonna handle calling on something like this, but seriously, kudos to that design. Next up, I want to talk about something of a trend that was across the board at a number of different uh, routers and kind of ISP adjacent brands. Uh, things like Fritz and TP-Link and Mercurius and a bunch of them were showing off a lot of Wi-Fi 7 power line adapters and Wi-Fi 7 repeaters. Now, why is that for me a bit odd? Well, mainly because the speed with which we enjoy, say, a power line adapter, where you have two plug points in different areas of your house and you use your mains power to carry data across, well, a lot of those can't exceed a gigabit. They can't. So you're looking at around 109 maximum megabytes per second, which already is, you know, in Wi-Fi 6 was already looking a bit arcane. And now, as we look at a lot of these devices making enormous promises for using power line adapters to, quote, harness the power of Wi-Fi 7, very few of them were making it clear that a lot of those benefits were only being felt from that single power line point that you're creating there. You can't really achieve the speeds of Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7 via a power line adapter, but still nonetheless, a lot of these brands were advertising a lot of these great highfalutin Wi-Fi 7 power line adapters and repeaters. And let's not forget, a repeater still has to be within a certain distance of another repeating Wi-Fi point in order to extend it. And given Wi-Fi 7's real abilities outside multi-link output, or MLO, um, are really about using the 60 gigahertz band, which has a much smaller area of effect, I really thought it was almost decept deceptive some of the advertising around these devices. We're gonna talk about this a lot more on the channel in a follow-up video, but I wanted to cover it because it was just over and abundantly clear that this was a direction they wanted to take here at the show. Next up, let's talk about SSDs. Remember these guys, Charge? Well, this is the Charge Disk Pro. This tiny little compact box here, this is to expand your storage by one, two, or four TB. Arriving with USB Type-C connectivity, this turned into a nifty little docking station, allowing standard USB and a 10 gig USB-C alongside a USB 2 and an HDMI output. Alongside that, it has active cooling on board. This tiny little compact storage unit is designed for your desktop client systems, but more precisely, it supports MagLink. So you can stick it there on the back of your device and it will attach directly on there. Again, we're seeing a lot more portable storage here at the show, and frankly, this is one I'm looking forward to reviewing on the channel soon. 
I'll be honest with you, it takes a lot to impress me these days when it comes to external storage. Every bugger's got an external SSD, an external USB drive. What do you do to set yourself apart from the crowd? Well, Fang Tiang here have released one with an ink display. You can modify this and have any picture you want. So yes, it's a two terabyte SSD. Yes, it's taking advantage, uh, up to eight terabyte SSD, I should say, taking advantage of a USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2, 20 gigabits per second connection, fine, that's all fair and well. But again, what really makes this SSD stand out is simply the fact that this is allowing me to have a customized display. If I've got a photo of, you know, my wife or realistically my cat, I can then make sure that I've got a lovely little picture that I'm carrying and of course, attach it to my phone if I need to via that magnet link. As I say, it takes a lot for an external bit of DAS storage to stand out to me these days, but fair play to them, it did the job. Next up, I want to talk about Netgear's new mobile router. They've had a series of them out over the years, and this is the M7 Pro. Now, it's arriving with 2.5 gig, but the big sell here is, of course, Wi-Fi 7. Support of MIMO, and looking at the notes there, it is a tri-band uh, router there as well. So again, it's interesting to see Netgear continuing to evolve this series. Early pricing seems to be about a thousand, so it's quite a big lay out there at the beginning but with a larger battery than previous generation a little over 5,000 milliamp it's still an upgrade over the previous generation there's also going to be an m6 and an m3 version as well next up with the rio link stand here at ifa now rio link is a, a brand i talked about a lot on the channel quite a few years ago but in the past few years I won't lie, a lot of their solutions kind of got much of a muchness. Now, the brand themselves are trying to revamp a lot of the AI revolution right now by rolling out a series of new cameras that are all forming part of the Rio Nura series. Now, these are cameras that, one, like in one scale or another, are going to feature a myriad, as you can see here, of different kinds of AI-assisted service. Now, no one camera in this new range supports the myriad of these services. Some of them are standalone NVR solutions with a handful of cameras, and other them are edge-based AI cameras. Everything from people counting to areas of effect, roaring of lines, heat maps, suspicious parcels, everything you can think of, there's different cameras in that range to support that service. But one of the most important questions that a lot of users are going to have is to do with subscription services. So do any of these cameras use this service with a subscription? And the answer is no. The majority of these cameras are all rolling out with that software included to a greater or lesser degree. Obviously based on the hardware spec of each of these cameras, the range of those services and the extent to which you can use them, things like smart detection and smart search and semantic search are going to be hard to come by on some of the more budget models that don't really have the horsepower inside to get the job done. Whereas a lot of the standalone NVR models, that is where you're going to see a lot more of that base uh, kind of AI service built in and hard baked with no subscription service. The messaging does still seem to feel just a little bit mixed and even the people I spoke to here on the stand were kind of giving me different answers about which cameras could do what and to what extent. But still nonetheless, it's nice to see the brand kind of innovating with AI within surveillance. It's one of the few areas that I think most users have less of a problem with AI integration in products in their home. Because let's face it, when you're going to have cameras running for days, weeks, months and years, it really will be beneficial. Also, before I forget, these cameras are still utilising encryption at either end. So a lot of this footage that's going to be going out, depending on the camera and the NVR that you're using, whether it is edge or remote level AI management there, it's worth remembering that transmission of that data is still going to be encrypted there. Again, that's still very much a sticking point for some users there. And do you know what? I'm tailing out today's video with the thing that caught me a little by surprise. Now, it's a little left field. It's not really the kind of stuff we normally talk about on the channel, but I do want to talk about it. Because when I saw it, it's a phone for pets, which I know on the face of it sounds bonkers, and I'll agree with you. When we walked past, me and Eddie were like, what's that mad S over there? But when you think about it, it's actually quite cool. I've got cats, and I quite like the idea 
of a two-way conversation. Because it's one thing to have cameras where I can pop on and then chat to my cats at home. But the idea that my cat could actually be wearing something around its collar that would then allow it to be able to initiate a conversation back, I find genuinely intriguing. I'm not going to pretend that there's a huge market for this. I'm not going to pretend that this is for everyone. But I am going to say, this is probably the quirkiest thing I saw at the show. But I'm genuinely intrigued. If there's anything I'm probably going to think about getting, I would be lying if I said I wasn't thinking about this. But thank you so much for coming uh, to this video and learning more about what we saw, the highs, the lows, and the weird here at IFA 2025. Again, there'll be links to everything we've discussed below, and I hope you've enjoyed our other, more specialised videos throughout this event. But from there, it's me and Eddie saying goodbye to you, and have yourselves a fantastic week.